Hey, it's Fitz, and if you don't know who I am, here's a quick bio. I'm a veteran sports journalist who writes, does TV, radio, daily YouTube videos, and I'm a longtime podcaster. Also, I have metastatic stage 4 prostate cancer that came out of remission in January of 23. During the pandemic, my doctors advised me to stay at home, and the Life of Fitz podcast was born. My original diagnosis forecast that I would be dead by age 60. But as I start season five of this podcast, I am 60 and still calling the many friends, athletes, coaches, colleagues, and medical advisors who I've met throughout my life. Oh, and I'm still hitting the record button and now doing so on video. Welcome to my life and the life of Fitz Podcast. Presented by the great people at Blueville Nursery in Manhattan. Welcome to another edition of Life of Fitz. And this was supposed to be last week's edition. Yeah, I kind of screwed up the interview and the audio was a mess after not hooking something up properly following my return from Las Vegas. Old man versus technology. Technology, you win this one. But I figured it out. And Jill Shields was good enough to come back into the Cats and Dogs studio and do it over again. And I was very generous of her to help me through my moment of senior citizenry. That wasn't easy to say. Jill is the number two person in the K-State Athletic Department. And she has worked her way up through the ranks, starting out as an academic advisor. And now she is the deputy AD under Gene Taylor. She has earned her stripes in the world of athletics, starting off as a really good basketball player and after college, then getting into coaching before moving into athletic administration. And along the way, she met a man. She met a man in Wichita when she was coaching for Wichita State, and she married that man. And that man, Mark Shields, is a high school graduate with me from Salina Central. Jill grew up just south of Salina, and they had to go to Wichita to meet, and now they live in Manhattan. So I've known Mark a very long time, and uh, thus, this was such a logical one I've been sitting on for a few years, and Jill's a really interesting person, and this conversation's a little bit different than the one I screwed up. It's got a little more stuff about college athletics in it that um, I think you're going to enjoy quite a bit. So now, let's bring in my friend... From right here in Manhattan, Kansas, Jill Shields. And now we welcome in Jill Shields again. <laughs> yeah, this is deja vu. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. We'll get it. We'll get it right one of these times. We recorded a whole show <laughs> at the audio echo. Hopefully this one doesn't do it. If it does do it again, you weren't meant to be on the show. I guess you not. just weren't. I appreciate I you coming not. over again. Um I'm trying not to replicate the previous conversation, but I do want to go back to the start because I found out last time we talked, we're from, you're from this area, just south of the mean streets of Salina, where yes. your husband Mark and I grew up. Yep. We were in a gang together. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, we were. Some tough yeah. slide was. Those were, those were rough, rough roads. And we were talking about back in the day, back before social media, you didn't know kids from other schools unless it was like a basketball camp which you probably did quite a bit of but for most of us even though you're in the same county we didn't know each other back then yeah it was a little different then i grew up 10 miles from mark and i did not know him at all that whereas now our, it probably is best <laughs> uh but yeah now our student athletes they connect with other student it's athletes nuts. from across the country it's crazy it's crazy how they all know each other i now. mean there are you know back back in the day there was some camps i don't know what was going on when you were coming up because you're younger, but it was Heart of America camp. Oh, right. Yeah. The old yep. King Cochran camp. Yep. And uh, we all did that. In fact, I mean, that was an elite camp back then. Yeah. I, I know this because Brad Underwood and Kevin Muff and Jeff Gio and all the guys that were really good uh, went to the other end of the floor for me. <laughs> they had a small group session with coaches and I had the guys that volunteered. You were at the other end? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hi guys. So, uh, uh, but yeah, it, now, now they just, there's social media, you just know everyone yeah. and it's nuts, but yeah. yeah, you grew up right next to your husband and didn't know it. So let's go back though. You, you hooped it up pretty good. And then you went to where I, I did go down the road. Um, 
about an hour, 15 minutes from here. It, it's not, it's not anything that's in my bio, <laughs> so um, but I did, I did. Uh, I was an infamous 424 transfer back in the day. Yep. So yeah, yeah. Went there and really had a good experience. It just, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. And um, had some injuries and ended up at the, uh, the great city of Great Bend, Kansas, and played for the Hall of Famer Jerry McCarty out there for nice. a year. Yeah. And uh, then ended up down in Florida at the University of Central Florida. So I've got them back in the back in the Big 12. So that's going to be be fun. And it, it's kind of exciting having them. What was their athletic standing back then? What conference were they? We were uh, Sunbelt. Yeah. I think maybe we were in the American at one point or Conference Conference USA, I believe. Yeah. So it was it they were bouncing at that time a little bit too. Um, but it was a lot of a lot of van uh van rides and if you were lucky you got in a chartered bus. So yeah. That level. You got it. Yes, yes. Yes, definitely. Well, it's made they've come a long ways. Yeah. They're flying everywhere now. They're, they are flying, flying everywhere now. No how, how cool is it though to have your alma mater back in the league? In it's the league. fun. It, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's I took the trip last year with women's basketball and uh, it's just changed so much. Yeah. When I was there, there were 20,000 students and now there's like 65,000. It's crazy. Students. So it's, uh, but it's fun to have them, have them in the league and to be able to, to talk to the coaches a little bit and, and just be supportive. And, mm -hmm. and obviously they know I'm a case stater, but, um, but it's still fun. Um, I, I think that athletic program could be a monster with that student, size of the student base that turns into alumni. What was the stat they said last year? 99% of their alumni are alive. Yeah. I, I would think that would probably be accurate. And the, the Stats. recruiting is completely different. Um, coaches don't have to get in an airplane every time they need to go recruit the, uh, it's just pretty fertile ground for, for many sports. <laughs> um, yeah. There's just a ton of talent down there. And, and I think they could be, become really, really good and powerful, especially once they recognize a little bit more of the revenue. Yeah. Yeah. They'll get there. They'll get there. Um, they're used to doing without. They've done yeah. pretty good without. Yeah. So, uh, but your knees g gave you up. They just wouldn't work anymore, would they? Yeah. They, they did kind of give out. They did. I think I've had six knee surgeries, oh. so it's just kind of figuring out now, um, the timing, uh, of, of, of when the next one's going to be and hopefully the last on each one. Yeah. So <laughs> once I go, they just yeah. keep giving you problems. Yeah. Yeah. I did one in high school <clears throat> and they always say with females, I don't, I can't remember the exact statistics, but there's a pretty high chance of, crazy. of tearing the other one. And, and I did four years later. So crazy. I, I remember interviewing a former K state player and her knees look like a roadmap. Yeah. It looked like the Kansas City Interstates. They were just crisscrossing <laughs> mine, scars. Mine are similar. <laughs> it's crazy. It, yeah, I don't know what it is about that particular sport and the construction of women's knees, but yeah. they, sometimes they just don't go together. Yeah. Uh, but that got you into coaching. Correct. And back in the neighborhood. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I coached for a few years down in the Florida, Georgia area, mm -hmm. uh, UCF, Florida Southern, North Georgia. And uh, then made my way back, wanted to get back home. Uh, basketball at that time especially wasn't, wasn't a priority necessarily in the state of Florida. You didn't have the same vibe then. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I made my way back, and I, I was an assistant coach with Linda Hargrove at Wichita State for five years. And, and then eventually uh, got married and decided it was time to, to find something new and uh, got on board in the student athlete services side of things at K-State. And you met Mark, my high school classmate in Wichita. I did. So I you, did. So I you saw, guys had to go somewhere else to meet instead of 10 miles away. We did. We did. <clears throat> instead of 10 miles away, it was in Wichita. And then we decided to take a leap of faith and come here on my low paying job at the time. And, um, yeah, he gave up his position and we came here with a five week old baby and mm. and we've been here now starting my twenty sixth year. It's crazy. Yeah. That's a leap of faith. It is. <laughs> it <laughs> well, worked crazy out. too, but it worked out. <laughs> it, it, did. it did. We were fortunate. So you got into academic counseling, and that's when I first met you when you were fairly new here and working for Phil Hughes, 
not Pete Hughes. Correct. I'm, ne I'm never going to get it right. I still type out <clears throat> Phil Hughes instead of Pete Hughes. When I did that the first time, my staff was like, that's not his name. And I'm like, oh, that was someone else. And like, <laughs> they thought I made that up. You know, I was like, no, this was really a guy. He was really nice. I enjoyed talking to him. He went to Michigan and you moved up. Correct. That is correct. I had a chance to move up and kind of oversaw the student athlete, uh, the academic side, student athlete development side. And um, yeah, John Curry came along and and then I kind of got into the sport administrator side of things, um, took on the role of senior women administrator. And that kind of opens up a little bit mm -hmm. um, more of a door as far as the governance side of the Big 12 conference and and so forth. So yeah, so did that for a number of years. And then once Gene came along, we there was a little bit more restructuring that he did, and and um, Kristen Waller took over that shop, and I moved up a floor, and and now kind of take care of whatever Gene doesn't want to take care of is kind of how I typically describe it. <laughs> so. that's, I don't know. That's kind of funny because Gene. Gene just seems like a casual guy, but when he gets down to work, he probably works really like, let me get back to talking to people. Yeah. Yeah. No, Gene's, Gene's great to work with. He's yeah. easy to work with. He's, he's not a micromanager. Um, he has high expectations, but I think he feels like he's got the right people in on board in the right positions. And we've got a great senior staff. Um, you know, it's a lot of collaboration and working together and bouncing ideas off each other and, I think at the end of the day, we're always trying to do what's best for yeah. K-State Athletics. And, and Gene's been an unbelievable leader for yeah, us. Yeah, he's amazing. Uh, let's rewind, though. How, what did you take away from your time as an academic counselor? You know, I think that's, um, that's a great question. I, I think as much as anything during that time, I really, you know, you learn how to work with the coaches. And that's probably the biggest thing. Um, because on a daily basis, that's, that's why we're doing what we do. But I think sometimes the student athletes and, and what's best for the student athletes and the coaches, um, gets lost. Um, but, but you learn how to, how to work best with them, what they need, how, how to support them. Um, yeah, I just think there's so many things that, that can be taken away when you have a chance to go to work every day. And that's all you're doing is trying to help the student athletes get their degrees. Um, you know, you're certainly trying to to make sure that that stays the priority of, of athletics. And, and sometimes you have to remind people that that's really why, we're, why we are doing what we're doing. We're trying to help our student athletes get their degrees. It seems like we're getting farther from that. It does. It does. And that's a little bit concerning. I think we have an unbelievable academic staff that that keeps that at the forefront. Um, but there's a lot of people now that are sometimes in the path of the student athlete with them making decisions on where they're going. It used to be a little bit simpler and that they wanted to go to a good athletic program. But then they were also, if not first on their list, at least second on their list was okay, what does your business degree look like? Or what does your architectural program look like? Um, so we have to make sure to remind them of those things and make sure that that's still what they're looking at and, and remind them of the value of the degree and that five or 10 years after you're done playing, that's, that's what you're leaning on. And you didn't just work for a coach. You worked with Bill Snyder, who is very wonderful man, but this is the way we need to do things. Correct. That's, That's correct. No, I did have an opportunity to work with, with football and coach Snyder for seven years with the academics. And it was, yeah. I mean, I remember my first meeting that I went to, I, I knew that I had to be really good because I think he, you know, he wasn't a hundred percent convinced that I was the person for the job. So over 140 guys and, I knew I needed to know every grade on every guy and every tutoring appointment. And if they had a low grade, what tutor appointments they had coming up and everything. But, but I think it really prepared me for, for future years and, and just the attention to detail and, and, and really just operating at a really high level and, and what it takes to be really good at, at the big 12 level. 
I can't even keep track of myself. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how you do that. That's uh, that's impressive. Yeah, that w- that was a few years ago. I, I honestly don't know that I could still do that. It was it was a lot. It's it was a lot. Patience. It does. It does. And you really have to enjoy it. I, I love working with the guys. They were terrific. Um, you know, I had two little little kids. Um, my youngest was was born um, when Darren Sproles was a sophomore. And I remember him carrying him around study table in the evenings for me because we were literally there every night till at least 10 o'clock, if not until 11 o'clock, uh, trying to get things done and and on the computers. And, and it's just different now because every student athlete has a laptop and they, you know, they, it's yeah. just a different setting now uh, than it was 15 years ago. It's weird. I Even I forget when you used to have to go somewhere to use a computer. Exactly. And a printer and all yeah. of those things. Yes. We had many, many late nights with guys in their slippers and, and would come up and we would just be there until the work got done. Yeah, that's, <laughs> if it was me, I would have been there much later than that because I put everything <laughs> off to the last second, including testing the sound before we started. <laughs> um, but that, that is a, really interesting way to get your base in college athletics because it's got to focus you entirely on the student athlete. You know what I mean? You see everything from their perspective. Yeah. Yeah. It it is different. I do. I still think some of the best people that work in college athletics are the ones that came up kind of through grassroots, um, whether they were student athlete or not, they at least, you know, started very entry level positions and kind of worked their way up. And those are typically, in my opinion, a lot of your most valuable employees mm-hmm. um, because they've done everything and nothing is beneath them. Um, you know, I mean, I remember a lot of days driving to campus and I would check classes all morning and I would check the front of the class and I would check the end of the class. Um, but you just did whatever it took to to help the guys be successful and be eligible and get their degree. And and it was uh, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah, that's that's a lot of work. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't check on my classes. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't there. I was unable to make it. I uh, it was it was too far a walk to campus. It was warm, cold out, hot, whatever. Yeah. There was always an excuse. Yeah. Uh, but now that you're in more um, of the administration as the deputy AD, you've got to be concerned about the transfer portal and its impact on the academics of these students. They transfer and they transfer and they transfer and they just can't have a transcript. Yeah. It's, it's getting difficult. It's getting difficult. Um, you, you know, you want them to have the understanding when they go into the portal, what they need to be eligible when they come out the other end at a different institution. Um, because most, most, for instance, most institutions don't allow a student athlete to transfer in more than 50%. It's crazy of a degree, and yet you may need sixty percent of a degree completion to meet NCAA requirements. So it's it's difficult, and it's yeah, it's it, it's tough. It's tough to see the student athletes just bounce in and out, and, and and maybe the rev share will change it. I don't know that it will. Um, I do think that extra year of COVID. Um, now that that's really for the most part that's in the past. Um, I think there'll be a few less transfers. You know, you mm-hmm. won't have that extra grad yeah. year. Um, there'll still be plenty go in the portal. But the thought is, is that maybe those numbers will go down a little bit. We'll see. Yeah, I would agree. That's that's an interesting point. But that bonus COVID year, I think when they said they were going to do that, we never expected it to have this level of impact. No. It really changed college athletics. And for did. a program like Kansas State, it help close the gap because yeah. maybe your six-year guys weren't quite good enough to go to the NFL, so they stuck around yeah. and played yeah. college football. Yeah, I, I think it probably benefited someone like K-State more than we anticipated. Mm-hmm. And um, and and I thought our coaches, though, were real strategic in, in how they used it, too. I'm not sure all coaches are as strategic as ours. I'm a little biased, but um, Coach Kleiman, for example, he's going to look at someone who's great for his locker room first mm-hmm. and then look at their film, whereas it's typically flip-flopped with a, with a lot of other institutions. Yeah. He, he told me that was one of the lessons that came out of COVID. You gotta, you gotta have your locker room yeah. Yeah. in good shape or nothing else works. Right. 
Um, so he really does put an emphasis on that. I'm, I'm fascinated by his recruiting because yeah. he uses his NIL kind of to retain more than acquire. Correct. And it's, I think it's a really wise use of it. Yeah. I think we probably need to keep his ways really secret because I think he's got it figured out, whereas I'm not sure the rest of the world has. Okay, never mind. I didn't say that. <laughs> Don't worry. Nobody watches it, so we're good. We're fine. Uh, let's take a short break and hear from our sponsor, Blueville Nursery. For competitively priced landscape design, irrigation, and lawn maintenance, turn to Blueville Nursery, a family-owned business with more than 50 years of experience. You can trust the Blueville team to design and create a landscape that will accentuate your property's aesthetics. And visit our garden store six days a week for the best products in the area. From ornamental trees, shrubs and flowers, Blueville has it all. Blueville Nursery, located on West Anderson Avenue in Manhattan, Kansas. Now, let's return to the studio. When a kid comes in with uh, a transcript, like, you know, let's say a quarterback transfers in for his bonus year, who actually evaluates a transcript, translates it to what K-State would do, and how do you fix what's not yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. <clears throat> uh, it goes through our academic staff. So Kristen Waller and Bill, ba if it's a football player, for example, Bill Banks is going to take an initial look at it, and you can get a fairly good idea, but it does then go to campus. So I don't think anyone anticipated across the country the work volume that we're all yeah. of us were putting on campus, because every time you have a transfer and you want to know, are they going to be eligible, someone from campus has to give you an, an official evaluation um, before you can tell a coach, OK, fly that student athlete in for a visit or yes, we can offer them aid um, because we may not know. That's crazy. <laughs> if, yeah. We have to make sure we have a real clear understanding. Are they going to be eligible at K-State? They may be eligible somewhere else, but that doesn't mean they're going to be eligible at Kansas State. always loved it with uh, the old rules when Bill Snyder was uh, recruiting junior colleges a lot. And wasn't there a state rule that the classes had to transfer to the state institutions from the JUCOs for the yeah, most Yeah, there was a matriculation yeah. agreement, and that was helpful um, because there were at times, you know, community college outside of the state of Kansas who would say there's no way this student athlete could be eligible. Well, yes, because, you know, you have those. And we have obviously the, the Jayhawk Conference was yeah. a great and still is a great recruiting uh, grounds for football. Uh, but, yeah, so it was a little bit of advantage. And we did have a number of, of community college guys <laughs> It's amazing how he used it. Yeah. I remember when he started doing that, everyone treated it like it was almost cheating. Like, yeah. like that's cutting corners. That's never going to work. Right. And, and then it worked. It did work. He was pretty smart. He he figured out how to how to build his program at K-State and what worked. And and the Jayhawk Conference was pretty, pretty beneficial to him. Back in the day, I had a reporter call me and say, how did K-State get that guy in from, I can't remember where he was, somewhere in Kansas. And he goes, we couldn't get... Our coach said that he didn't have enough credits to transfer. Yeah. I go, well, that's because your academics were kicking out classes. Kansas, they have to yeah. take those classes. Yeah. It's a and, little different if they're in state. And yeah. I'm like, dude, we're we're a land grant school. <laughs> we're for the people. <laughs> we're for the people. We're not we're not kicking people out based on what they did. We're looking to the future. We're we're basing it on what they can be. Uh, yeah. So, but that that. I'll just say it. That's going to make it easier. Be an academic person at K State because you're probably getting in more of the players. You're probably, yeah. It w what really gets in the way for for everyone though is there's still the sometimes people forget there's still the NCAA requirements. Right. The progress towards degree that if you're going into your third year you have to have forty percent of a degree complete. If you're going into your fourth year you have to have sixty percent. So on and so forth. So. That's that's still, you know, those those requirements are still in place for everyone. And it's the more you transfer, you know, everyone's going to lose hours. So mm -hmm. I think you probably see a lot of transfers at their next institution that are taking a lot of summer classes at that institution so that they can be eligible. Yikes. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'm glad um, they didn't have that rule for fraternities. <laughs> I think I have some fraternity brothers that were not at maybe 50%. would not have been eligible. Yes, <laughs> yes. The the seventh year of eligibility bartending in Aggieville, <laughs> they, they finally started to finish up their degree. 
<clears throat> living the life. Yeah. Let's uh, let's turn our attention now, just kind of the NCAA and where we're at with everything going on in the world of college yeah. sports. Jill, it's unbelievable how much has changed in the last five years. Yeah. It's unsettling, but a lot of it's been driven by the courts. Yeah, it it is very unsettling. We just um, just had some meetings with a couple of coaches this morning and trying to schedule a meeting here for two weeks from today to get them all together. And, and at that time, we'll tell them what we do know and, and try to gather more information. Uh, the House case, yeah, we'll probably have a preliminary anyway settlement signed um, in September and then probably the first part of the year. <clears throat> That will be finalized, but um, we have some good idea of what's in, in that, but there's still a lot of unknowns, a lot of questions that our coaches have as far as how things are going to work, um, and we don't have all the answers right now, but trying to get those, the early signing period in November is a little bit of a concern because rev share, there's still a lot of questions surrounding the revenue share and what that looks like and and. Roster limits, we know what those limits are going to be, but we still don't know, you know, all of the answers to as far as aid and scholarship makeup. So this might be a question you can't even answer, but is this judge basically setting the rules, like saying how you have to spend the money and what? Well, I think there will she will at least be putting guardrails around it is my understanding and our understanding. Um we will find out more as we get the details, um, but a little, a little bit she is, and um, the NCAA how they will pivot and and what you know new rules some of the oversight committees will come out with whether it's football oversight or the basketball oversights has you know is yet to be seen, um, but I there will be a chain reaction with mm-hmm. all of those those committees once we know what the settlement. Um, what the guardrails are around some of this. I haven't had guardrails for a while. That might be no, good. No, no. NCAA failed at that. When, yeah. when they started losing the court cases, they just didn't offer direction to the institutions. No. It's crazy. No, we really didn't. And, and yeah, I do think President Baker is, is trying. Um, he got dealt a pretty shorthand, um, but he's, I think, the right guy to be in the position now at the NCAA office. And I think he's working hard to, you know, put the pieces back together and try to put forward a model that we can all work with and, you know, have some parameters and and some guidelines and guardrails and and try to make it to where we're not living in the wild, wild west. I think that's what everybody wants. That's what the coaches want. That's what the student athletes need. Um, We just, we've got to get some things back in the box a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I keep telling people this, the NCAA is kind of like the highway patrolman. And if he's going to let you go 10 miles an hour over the limit, people are going to do it. Mm-hmm. If he's not out there and you know it, they're going to go 95. Correct. They're going to try to get ahead. Yeah. And that's what's happened now. Yeah. People are just. Yeah. The courts have, have really clamped <clears throat> down too on the NCAA and what they, every time they, and, and I think it's important to remember the NCAA all of the institutions make up the NCAA right. in our rule book. There's a lot of silly rules, but those were all written by the membership. <laughs> right. We do forget that. So we but do the, forget the, that. The enforcement though, but comes the out enforcement and, and yes, we, we've got a enforcement is, is something that's got to change and they've got to know what they're enforcing. It's um, a small detail. Um, they, they're the house case will st- Revenue share with student athletes based on your university's revenue, or is it based on that average? No, it will be based on the average. Oh boy. Yeah. So that, if you're, that's our understanding right now, and it is up to a certain dollar amount. Okay. So and if you're I, Kansas State with a smaller budget, is it going to be a bigger percentage of your budget probably goes to rev share? I believe so. Wow. I believe so. And, and I think that's what the Big 12 um, athletic directors and, and so forth are trying to determine is obviously our revenue is not the same at 50,000 yep. seat Bill Snyder Family Stadium as it is at the Michigan or Ohio State and so forth. So I think they're trying to get a clear understanding. And that is part of what we don't know yet. Okay, I'm going to get into the numbers a little bit because numbers on podcasts always work well. <laughs> if you have a set amount that you've got to provide student athletes, in rev share, 
but you only have the minimum number of sports as opposed to a Stanford that has 30 and you guys have 16, does that mean the student athletes will actually get more money per person? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so because I do think our revenue will not, I, I think it will be different. I mean, you look at a Michigan, they have over a thousand student athletes and we have learned in the last couple of weeks um, that the revenue share and, and the roster caps and all of that do still have title nine implications. Okay. So if we rate, if we, increase football scholarships by 20, then we've got to, you know, you have to adjust that on the, on the female side too. Um, so none of that's going away. We do know that. So we'll have to, f what K-State looks like will be different than what Texas Tech okay. looks like or Kansas looks like or anyone. Um, we do have the minimum number of, of teams, obviously. And, and I do think that will be an advantage to us. Um, we don't have to consider, do we have to cut a sport? We're at the minimum. We know we're not going to cut a sport, and that's a huge advantage for us, and we don't want to have to cut a sport. No. Um, we want to figure out how to support them more. We want to have a, a really quality athletic department from 1 to 16, and that's important to Gene, and and we're just trying to figure out how to how to do that best with whatever those numbers are. We really don't know. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's yeah. coming down by athletics fast. You know, by the standard of college athletics, it's coming soon and people still don't know what they're going to yeah. be facing. It's nuts. Yeah. Um, but uh, you brought it up, the number of scholarships. Now there's a proposal from the membership to raise those numbers in certain sports, including football, which I think is silly. Uh, I'm happy to see baseball and softball getting full roster funding, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, it was they were under scholarship. Volleyball's getting some more men's basketball's getting to being back to equal with women's basketball, which was always weird to me. Yeah. But football is looking at going from 85 to 105, which it was when Bill Snyder arrived. It's a different landscape now, but I'm not comfortable with it. That's going to take so yeah. many players out of the process that I think the non power schools, the FCS, even down to Division Two, are going to have this huge loss of the player pool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's important to remember that the 105 is a roster limit. Right. So you can't go over. You can fund up to 105, right. but that doesn't mean you have to fund right. 105 full scholarships. So those are all numbers for the roster only, and your scholarships can go up. I think the athletic directors um, in our conference are all talking about, you know, do we raise our, our numbers up? And, and what does that look like? And is that a per institution decision or is that a conference decision? Does that get into the perception of you're not taking this as seriously as Ohio State that has 105 scholarships? Yeah, I, I think it could, but I think everyone has to do too what they can afford to oh, of do. Of course, yeah. And, well, I don't um, know that. I just do stuff. <laughs> you don't talk to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's what everyone's trying to figure out. We know what we can do, but what can we really do? Yeah. Um, it's easy to say we can have all of those fully funded, but the money has to, we do have to identify the, the revenue stream. I just feel like something else is coming. You know, we had the NIL and then we had the transfer portal and it's like, okay, some, some, I feel like something <laughs> else is coming. The courts uh, are going to find something uh, else. We, we can't have up. more than this. This is, this is enough. It's we've, crazy. Got, we've got to figure this one out first. Will some athletic departments, and this is a hypothetical because you know, K-State, not everyone, but Will some athletic departments just be absolutely crushed by this ruling? I think so. That that's my opinion. That's my opinion. But yes, I I just think there's there's only so many dollars, and 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 most institutions now are are spending. You, you know, you're a, you're a nonprofit. You're spending what you make. Um, well, so most to come are up with more. yes, or yeah, and and so now, I think everyone is is thinking about where does that extra money come from. So I think, you know, other than the budget being smaller, I think K-State's in a good position because uh, I'm not a huge John Curry fan, but there was a few things he did right. He promoted you and uh, <laughs> he was so good with raising money and bring fiscal intelligence to the yeah. athletic department. Yeah. And that's been carried over. Uh, and K-State has maintained its budget. It stayed under budget yeah. quite a bit. Um, most departments are that way. Most yeah. departments are what's our... It's outgo is income plus 10%. I mean, they're just always over budget. Right. And I don't see how you're going to be able to do that in the future. Yeah, it's it's going to be hard. But but you're right. John John did do a terrific job. We 
get the the big thing too is he got the facilities projects Absolutely. going. And um, some of the institutions now that have those on the horizon, um, that would trouble. be really concerning. I'm glad we have those. And I think Gene, I know Gene would tell you the same thing, that, that we have those behind us instead of in front of us is huge for K-State. It's enormous. And I think some of the Pac-12 schools are going to come into the conference and go to Ames or Stillwater and go, how do these little schools that we yeah. look down upon have so much better facilities? Yeah, yeah I agree. The arms race in the Big 12 was legit. Mm -hmm. What happened to the Big 12 with Oklahoma and Texas losing, if I recall, moving out, I should say losing them. Uh, if I recall, Gene, like, put everything on the front burner at that point. We got to get our facilities up and yeah. ready to go in case something happens yeah. in the conference. Yeah. It was smart. That's, yeah. No, very smart. Very smart. And, and. Yeah, that that we have the football indoor done and the facility for volleyball completed and and we've got the basketball training facility and yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, huge. I, I, huge for us. Yeah, I ended up talking to the new track coach to replace the that never mind, I don't want to get into it. And the, Travis was talking about um how incredible the track facilities are. Yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to go, dude, you should have been here three years ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we good. could have shown you. Yeah. Cliff <laughs> worked his whole career he and did. finally got it. And he did. Out. He did. I'm so happy, though, that for Cliff that he did see that, you know, he be completed. It. And 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 Travis did a terrific job at, at his interview and and just kind of acknowledging the detail of the facility and and what a great world-class training facility that he has now thanks to cliff so yeah, that, well, that was pretty cool it is and you know i i still haven't been in the volleyball arena or the olympic training facility so no, need, we might need to yeah. drive over and show you that yeah i'm i'm i don't want to get on the volleyball court and show anyone up it'd be embarrassing <laughs> it just it'd be embarrassing if i started spiking <laughs> like a good jump <laughs> like it, that it, yeah, ever in my future jumping in no no <laughs> not gonna happen uh so I guess my dreams of a renovated Bramlage Coliseum and a softball program are out the window. Probably at least on the back burner for a bit, I think. I think so. I think so. Damn it. Yeah. Yeah. We probably won't be looking to add anything for a while. No, just, no nobody will. Yeah. I just think it's, it's, I think everyone's focused on trying to take care of the student athletes that you have the facilities that you have and, and then trying to figure out the, the rev share and the scholarships and so forth. I also feel like ADs who have wanted to cut sports, but that gets so political with donors. And I mean, you, you don't want the revolt of the student athletes and their moms and dads yeah. yelling at you, but now they have a pretty tangible excuse. Well, we've got to do something because the courts have ruled this. Yeah. I fear a lot of these Olympic sports are going to be diminished because of this ruling. Yeah. It will be interesting to see what happens. I I do think the Olympics um, couldn't have come at a better time. I think there's going to be a, you know, there's always the appreciation for all of our um, college trained Olympians representing the U.S. So, you know, it couldn't have come at a better time. I think that's going to, I think you'll see probably some advertising through the NCAA, um, the Olympics on how many of those that are competing for the U S mm -hmm. um, just left Stanford or whatever institution, Kansas it's always state. Stanford, Stanford uh, offers Stanford, every Stanford's sport. Got, yeah. They do offer every sport, uh, Michigan, some of those, but um, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. There. Now there's been talk of schools like tiering their athletic departments. So title nine is about athletic opportunities, not necessarily scholarships. Yeah, there's three different prongs of, of Title IX, and without getting too much in the weeds, um, yeah, could they be tiered? Yes. Um, will some institutions probably do that? Potentially, you could you could tier sports and and take away some you know some of the services that you provide other other teams. Um, that's certainly not the route we want to go. Um, with only 16 sports um, and the staff right now in place to take care of them. Right. Our hope is that we can continue to to take care of all of them at, at the level we are right now. So I, I kind of feel like as traumatic as this is going to be through college athletics, and it will be for K-State because of the budget, it's still going to be a little less dramatic. It's yeah. not going to be cutting sports. You're not going to be yeah. de-scholarshipping, if that's yeah. a word, yeah. uh, things. You're yeah. going to kind of be status quo, but – 
probably with a bunch of cuts. Yeah, to yeah. Work. People might notice a few, you know, some some subtleties around some of the teams and the way they operate and so forth. I hope not. That remains to be seen. Um, you know, we've got to kind of see how it plays out and and what the rev share numbers are. We don't have those numbers necessarily yet, um, so we're still trying to figure some of that out. I uh, I asked Jean, I don't know how long ago, a month ago, about some scheduling stuff, and he goes, you got to talk to Jill. I gave that to Jill. She <laughs> said, hey, do you want me to take that? And I said, yes, please take this. <laughs> so how is football? People just don't understand what a mess trying to schedule football games in the future is. Yeah, yeah football's it's a, it's a big one. Um, yeah, because you kind of get on a cadence, too. Um, you know, with five home games or four road games yep. and, and then you flip flop it the next year. And you know that in an even year, typically in an even year, um, you're playing all your non-conference games at home. And then mm -hmm. the next year you've got one of those on the road. The problem is, cause you know, a lot of times I, I have people say, well, why don't you schedule Nebraska? Why don't we get some of those? I agree. And, and, and we try, right. the, the problem is, is when they're on the same cadence that we are, mm -hmm. you know, they may have their power five non-conference game. Opposite. Exactly. Yeah. And then that makes it hard. We, we've lucked out a little bit with Missouri. Um, and that was a great series. Would love to see at some point that able to continue. Totally um, but now it's trying to, you know, we've got the Arizona, which is kind of odd. It's odd for them. It's odd for us. We didn't want to, to keep that, but, to schedule a, you couldn't find anyone. No, at that point. there was no one. Still trying to work on the Colorado series that we lost. Is that next, or is there? Uh, that's the twenty seven twenty eight. That's twenty twenty seven twenty twenty eight. Is the Colorado mm -hmm. series. So trying to replace that one, and that's hard too because you you schedule out beyond that, and um, and it's tough to find find the opponents. So so I'm curious about this, and this this is good. We're having to redo it because now I can. I should ask this. I can do it now. Uh, with the state of college football, where we're headed with two conferences clearly being better funded than everyone else, uh, and the Big 12, and even the ACC, trying to prove that, well, the funding might be different, but competition, we can play with them. Mm -hmm. uh, is there an effort to try to schedule Big 10 SEC in the non-con? And yeah. Are they open to it? Yeah. You know, that's it's a good question. Um we haven't gotten there yet. Um, we have, you know, we have our power five opponent, our one that we typically right. play in the non-conference scheduled out to like 2032. Yeah. Um, so do we look, look beyond and look at, you know, Oklahoma again and, and so forth. We had talked to them when we knew they were leaving the, the conference about, you know, a potential um, home and home with them. Our fans would love it. It would be a great draw for them. It would be a great draw for us. And I do think we'll continue to try to get them back on the schedule, but who knows when that will be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, th I think we will try to continue with a Big Ten opponent or an SEC. Uh, you know, whether they want to play us will right. be the big thing, though. Honestly, if I'm them, I don't. Yeah, exactly. I got everything to lose here. Exactly. Um, exactly. So that, that will be interesting, particularly if everything plays out and the ACC ceases. It's going to, yeah. I don't know who K-State's going to play in the non-conference if right. they won't play. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Can and Also, can I get a series? I know Army's coming up next season. Army's yes. coming in. Can I get a home and home with them? Home and away? Like, <laughs> you want to go to Army? I want to go to Army. <laughs> I think it'd be really cool. Let's see what we can do. <laughs> but it's not really, uh, are they going to the American this year, aren't they? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So at least they're not independent. Yeah. 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 You having fun trying to schedule? You got Oregon State, which was really good. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Know, I didn't want to go to Piscataway. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, they didn't want um, they didn't want us, and we didn't really care to to go oh. ahead and fulfill that. And yeah, so Oregon State will be good. You know that that was after the Pac-12 fell apart, mm -hmm. and and uh, can it, it happened to work for us when we needed a series? So trying to help them a little bit and. And help us and it, it worked out so we'll head to oregon here okay well long. if you ever need any advice on scheduling i'm here for your <laughs> okay. sister. I I, I'll, I'll give you a call <laughs> i got it i got it well tell mark hi um, we'll do. although now mark and i are texting and as we discussed last time we got to get fire pit time in although Absolutely. probably won't be with a fire in kansas <laughs> 
Plus, not, ne- not next week anyway. I don't think you could burn a fire with the humidity. I don't <laughs> think it's possible to get a fire to light right now in the state. So, but we'll get all that taken care of. Okay, that sounds good. That Plus, sounds great. We're going to be really busy in August. So. That's true. You know, thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. Have you ever done something so dumb, embarrassing, because you screwed something up, and you were a little bit not wanting to confess to this, but you needed to? That was me in our first interview with Jill. Yep. I just hooked up something wrong, had the wrong toggle switched, and all the sound was ruined. It was very gracious of Jill to come back in. And I got to tell you, Jill Shields is a really good soul. And so is her husband, Mark. I've known him for, well, a long time. We went to high school together. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. It steered a little bit more into athletics than the one that I ruined. Uh, But I thought there were some things going on in college athletics that needed to be addressed right now. And that was fun. Plan on being back next week. Schedule's beginning to warm up, though, for football as we have our first football practice at Kansas State to go watch on August 1st. And somehow that's right around the corner. I appreciate everyone listening. I'll talk to you real soon. I appreciate you listening to this week's edition of Life of Fits. And thank you to all the great people at Blueville Nursery for sponsoring our show. This has been a Spirit Street production.